Psychiatry from the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Medicine from the UPPGH and went further to have her Master of Bioethics degree from the Center for Values, Ethics, and the Law in Medicine from the Sydney Medical School in Sydney, Australia. She has uh, many current professional affiliations, among which are Clinical Associate Professor of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Medicine of the UPPGH. She is Chair of the Hospital Transplant Ethics Committee of both the St. Luke's Medical Center, uh, QC and Global, and she is a member of the Hospital Bioethics Committee of the St. Luke's Medical Center and a faculty in bioethics of the Ateneo School of Medicine and Public Health. She is also the head of the section of psychiatry of the National Kidney and Transplant Institute and is a consultant in the St. Luke's and the Medical City. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our first speaker, Dr. Mary Agnes L. Busuego. To follow the talk of Dr. Agnes is a doctor and a lawyer. He obtained his uh, medical degree from the USC College of Medicine and obtained his law degree from the Faculty of Civil Law from the USC also. He has many affiliations. He is an international fellow of the American College of Legal Medicine. He is board certified and a diplomat of the American Board of Legal Medicine. He is a founding member of the Philippine Association of Forensic Medicine and the Philippine Medical Legal Society Incorporated. He is a member of both the PMA and the Integrated Bar of the Philippines. He has many teaching appointments. I counted them and it was 13 all in all among which are as faculty of medicine of the UST, of the St. Luke's College of Medicine, of the UP uh, College of Public Health, and the UERM Institute of uh, Medicine. And he is also a faculty in various law schools, among which are FEU Institute of Law, CEU School of Law, and the UST Faculty of uh, Civil Law, among others. He is also a medical legal consultant of 26 hospitals. I did not mention them all because there are too many to mention. And currently he is chairman of the St. Luke's Medical Center College of Medicine, Department of Legal Medicine. And, and he is a practicing lawyer and doctor all at the same time. So I'm talking about attorney Antonio Alejandro Rebosa. So he will join us later after the talk of Dr. Rabusuego. So without much ado, I would like to introduce to you again, our first speaker to talk on the ethical issues in the time of COVID-19, Dr. Mary Agnes Busuego. Thank you very much, Dr. Cruz. Um, I'll just share my screen. Okay, uh, thank you to the PCP for the kind invitation and the D Department of Health. Um, the title of my talk is Ethical Issues in the Time of COVID-19. Can you all hear me? Okay, so I'll be following this outline. Um, we'll look at the ethical principles that are seen in a pandemic and then what is the difference between a pandemic and the rest of what happens in the world. Uh, we'll look at specifically duty to care and the duty to protect healthcare workers, resource allocation, advanced care planning, research, and telehealth. So what ethical principles guide us in terms of um, pandemics? What we look at is fairness to make sure that the standards are to the highest degree possible recognized as fair by everyone affected by them. We also look at duty to care, where the standards are focused on the duty of healthcare professionals to make sure that uh, we care for the patients and people who really need medical attention. Remember the principles, the ethical principles that we learned in medical school, yung autonomy, uh, beneficence, non-maleficence. Konti lang yon, marami pang iba. So these are specifically what we look at in terms of a pandemic. We also look at the duty to, re, uh, to steward resources, to make sure that the resources are um, distributed amongst everyone, knowing that they are scarce, that 
the utilitarian goal of saving the greatest number of lives is followed. Um, we also want to be very transparent in our decision making. Uh, for example, like what the DOH is trying to do now, that they are uh, holding daily information, um, public information uh, outlets. So everyone has a chance. And even I even saw the spokesperson reading text messages and tweets from other from questions from the general public, which is really good. Um, because then we can be transparent in the decision making. Um, we need to be consistent with our decisions, that these decisions apply to all the populations, not just to the rich or to the poor or in other countries to um, other cultures lang, but equally, regardless of their human condition. It also must be proportional. So public and individual requirements must be commensurate to the scale of the emergency. Thus, it doesn't mean that if nothing much is happening, birahagad, hindi ganon. So it has to be commensurate. Um, and then to the, to the degree of the scarce resources. What about accountability? We need to be, naturally, we need to be accountable for all the decisions that we're making. Um, so the implementation of standards and governments to ensure that the appropriate protections are, are there. So I'm sure after all of this, audits will be done to make sure that all the decisions were just. Okay, what is different with the pandemic? Um, you remember at the beginning of all of this, people were people kept on asking, when is it a pandemic already or is it an epidemic? The reason being, once you get to a pandemic, there is a shift from regular regular treatment to triage. So that means from conventional capacity, we try to go to contingency capacity and to crisis capacity. Specifically, if we look at conventional capacity, these are the ordinary uses of resources and the standards of care that we're always trying to uphold. When we get to contingency, there is a disruption. So we saw that we were getting a little wary about mechanical ventilators and then the PPEs were, we were trying to get as much PPEs as possible. But generally, the standard of care is still the usual standard. The idea is try not to get to crisis capacity. Crisis capacity is where there's disruption of the standard of care because you don't have that many resources available anymore. So the goal um, is to sufficiently try to take care of our patients given, given the circumstances. Um, so if we look at contingency, the primary goal is to limit the amount of time in crisis. So once you get to crisis, try to get to contingency as much as possible. For example, we, tr we use the method of conserving. We cancel elective procedures to preserve the PPEs. So that's what we did. The hospitals, con um, I think for the past two months, have not been uh, accepting elective procedures. Um, now they are trying to slowly get into it again. Uh, we substitute by... For example, using telehealth instead of in-person clinic appointments or um, our nursing staff from clerical work became ER. Um, we also adapt by, for example, cleaning PPEs for reuse rather than disposing each time. Or um, in some hospitals, what they did was to suggest that people use, to conserve their N95 masks, people use the N95 and another a surgical mask on top of that so they could reuse their N95s. So during a contingency, the standard of care uh, is still do what you think is best for your patient. However, you follow the guidelines. Some revised guidelines were given. Uh, the PCP came out with their guidelines and also international guidelines have come out. Um, if you look at the duty of care, Question is, why do we expect healthcare workers to risk their lives in this pandemic? Um, well, when we started out our profession, remember that we promised to care. That is the main thing. You know, the healthcare profession is a service profession. Um, another one is that our skills aren't necessarily easily transferable. Yes, we have residents, we are training, 
However, it takes a long time to train them. So we cannot just tell people what to do. We have to be there to guide them. And by taking on the profession, there really is an inherent risk. But there is also our own duty to take care of ourselves. Um, not just not just psychiatric, psychologically, because I'm a psychiatrist, but also, you know, the senior consultants, you don't have to, because you are also at risk for the for the COVID, you don't have to go to the hospitals, but you can guide your junior consultants on what to do. Or if you are immunocompromised, you don't have to. Um, but if you really want to do something for your profession, you could do some. You could do other things, like for example, lectures in in webinars. Okay, the duty to care involves the respecting the rights of patients in terms of autonomy, privacy, confidentiality. I will differentiate the two later. Um, informed consent and advanced directives. If you respect these rights of the patients, then you will actually naturally try to care for the patients. So one example of this is being strict about the no visitors rule. Um, Filipinos in general, you know, they like to take care of their loved ones when they're in the hospital. And they have a really difficult time understanding why they cannot do this when there's a pandemic now. And even when, they're, when their loved ones pass away, they're not allowed to see them, right? Kaya lang, it's really for the, you think about the, uh, what is best for society and for, even for the visitors. Eh? So, to be able to do this, because we care for them, we always have continued communication. So it doesn't mean that we tell them, no, you cannot visit. But we also co um, communicate. For example, UP, um, and I think a lot of other hospitals, what they did was for the patients to be able to talk to their loved ones, they have computers in the, in the wards. And then they, can, they have a set time to be able to at least see them and talk to them, even if they cannot touch them. Okay. Looking at patient autonomy, um, you know, the Philippines and the Asian culture is not, not as strong in terms of autonomy compared to the Western and more developed cultures. Uh, you see in the United States where they're uh, rallying because they, want, they don't want to wear masks and they don't want to be in quarantine. So Philippines, wala namang ganun eh, no? Kaya lang, in a public health crisis, the respect for the common good has to be prioritized. So rather than individual autonomy, uh, the public, the, uh, the, the good of all is better. So for example, mandatory quarantine, vaccination, mandatory vaccination, and mandatory treatment. Um, you hear of those patients who try to escape the hospitals if they're COVID positive and then they try to escape and the police get them because they need to be treated because it's not just about them. It's about the rest of the world, rest of the country or the barangay. So with autonomy, we have to look at the capacity for decision making. Um, some patients may be delirious, some patients may become psychotic, some patients may be unable to make decisions for themselves. So in that regard, their autonomy will have to be, um, is, they are not autonomous in that way. Someone else will have to make the decision for them. Okay. So consent, the idea of this cartoon is consent can be looked at from different angles. And you just have to make sure that you, you see it from the patient's point of view as well as your own point of view. So informed consent has many elements. We look at com competence or capacity. Competence, remember, is uh, determined by the judicial system. It is capacity that we as clinicians look at, the capacity for decision-making. The decision has to be voluntary. Um, there has to be enough information disclosed and that information has to be understood by the patient or the person making the decision. And there has to be a very specific decision. So for example, admission into the hospital. Admission into the hospital doesn't mean just one consent. It's consent to be admitted, but, but they also need consent to be for procedures to be done on them. Some hospitals, um, 
you need consent to refer to someone else. So they put that in. And the chosen treatment has to be authorized. So um, there are sometimes hospitals, because they have blanket. It, it says, and there's a blank, and then it says um, for some procedure. Kailangan very specific, and kailangan yung authority. Okay. What information is needed? I think this is important because some of us uh, assume that the information that we give is enough, but this is technically what you need. The diagnosis, the prognosis, options for investigation and the different options for treatment. What are the burdens and the benefits of the treatment? If there are any side effects, if it is conventional or experimental, especially nowadays, uh, now that we are actually experimenting on different drugs to treat COVID. Who will be performing the procedure? Uh, what are the consequences of choosing or not choosing the treatment? Are there any short-term and long-term outcomes? How long is it going to be? And what is the cost? These decisions should depend less on respecting autonomy and more on wanting to provide care with compassion. Um, you know how a lot of a lot of doctors now are practicing defensive medicine. My suggestion is rather than practicing defensive medicine, thinking that I have to do everything just to avoid litigation, it think of it in terms of more I want to respect and provide compassion, compassionate care for this patient. If you if your approach is that way, you will be less, the patient will be less litigious. So consent is a two-way process. It's shared information, informed decision making. So rather than the doctor making the decision, I know some patients will tell you, "Doctora, kayo na lang po ang bahala." Pero yung kayo na lang po ang bahala, I want to make sure that they understand what's going on, pa rin. So, so it's still two-way process. And remember, patients have the right to refuse and accept treatment. Sometimes it's very difficult for us as doctors to, to respect the decision of the patient to refuse treatment because our training is to prolong life. But um, if the patient has the capacity for decision making, you know, they're not depressed, they're not psychotic, um, it is a rational decision, then they have the right to refuse. Going to capacity. Um, when we say capacity, that is the ability to understand relevant information to make a decision. I already differentiated competence versus capacity. Um, capacity is specific and can change over time. So sometimes when you talk to a patient, mainit, maamoy sa ER, iba yung decision nila sometimes versus when they're in the, in the ward already or in the room. So if it's a better, better environment, mas maganda yung usapan ninyo, they can change their minds. Okay. Or sometimes we do get referrals as psychiatrists to help the patient try to, to help the doctor try to change the mind of the patient if they don't agree. It's not a, it's not a guarantee, but we can help sometimes. Okay, confidentiality. Ganito ba kayo? I never give away a secret, but I exchange it for another. Or, kayo ba yung tipong doctor who in the elevator talks about your patients? Even if you don't mention the name, sometimes the cases can be identified pa rin eh. So you have to make sure confidentiality is guarded. We are obliged as physicians to be, to be able to keep information confidential. Um, and that is because we respect autonomy and the patient's rights. Um, the difference is privacy is the ownership of one's body or information, and confidentiality is the private information, restricting the private information that is revealed in confidence. So that's the difference. So sometimes we say you have to keep private and confidential. Okay. Um, it can be socially and culturally determined how many patients of yours come into your clinic with a whole barangay. Or even, you know, I, I have had the patient, and I'm a psychiatrist, I have had the patient say, Doctora, pwede ko pang dalhin po yung mga neighbors ko? Kasi kailang kilala nila ako eh. <laughs> Not even relatives. Pag ganun, so, um, I say, ah, okay lang mamaya, tayo muna mag-usap. 
pero that's psychiatry. For your specialty, sometimes you want the um, the close relatives to be there to and because your your ano, your clinic your clinic time is so much um, you have so many patients. Sometimes you see the patient for 15 30 minutes. Oh, mahaba na 30 minutes ata. <laughs> pero so you want all the information that you can get. However, try to keep confidentiality. You disclose information as well as record keeping to a, you, to a minimum. Um, record keeping. Your records, your secretaries have access to your records. Who has access to your records? Um, for some doctors, I know that the, the secretaries don't even have access to their records. Some doctors have electronic records already. Okay, uh, So the, the Data Privacy Act is there for a reason and you have to you have to respect the privacy of the patient. Okay. Um, this includes all the information relating to our professional relationship with the patient. For example, when people call our clinics and then they say na, relative po ako ni Meg Busuego, um, ano ho nga uli yung mga gamot niya? You have to make sure that they're really relatives and you know them before you disclose um, this, this information. So you have to make reasonable precautions to ensure that your records are confidential. Are your computers password protected? Um, if your if your phones if your smartphones are connected to your clouds, are they password protected as well? What is the difference then in a pandemic? Uh, we have contact tracing. Remember, so when we oblige patients to reveal who they have been with. Uh, that is a difference in a pandemic. We have to make sure that we are able to trace these contacts. Okay. So necessarily, confidentiality is a bit compromised. However, I have heard, I don't know how they do contact tracing here, but in other countries, the dialogue is usually, um, you have been exposed to someone who has turned out to be COVID positive, and therefore you will need to be seen by a physician and tested and then quarantined. So they don't name exactly who was the COVID positive person. Um, and I think that's a very good thing because then you don't have any blame. You don't put any blame on anyone and there is no stigma involved. Okay? Be and um, Talking about stigma, have you heard of those uh, communities? Some communities actually hear of a COVID positive household and they freak out and they do all sorts of, um, they stigmatize the whole household because they're COVID positive. And this is not just to protect the community, but really it's it's stigma. It's a negative thing. It's not, it's not um, to protect them, okay? So, all of the duties of the healthcare workers we already talked about. But reciprocally, there is a duty for the community to take care of us. And not just the community, but the hospitals, our hospitals. They're, they have to keep us safe to the best of their abilities. So um, are you being provided with, a, with good PPEs or are you having to do your own PPEs? Um, are you given guidelines on what to do? So that is the duty to protect the healthcare workers. Resource allocation. Um, it is a fact. Not all who could benefit will receive treatment because resources are scarce. In our country, uh, you know that there are scarce resources in terms of hospital beds, ICU beds, mechanical ventilators. So we have to allocate these scarce resources responsibly. And the idea is to maximize benefit to the greatest number of people. So this is the utilitarian public health way of thinking. Um, in other countries, in Italy, for example, they were already having to decide not to resuscitate or not to give mechanical ventilators to the more elderly population because they were in crisis mode already. And they found that the elderly had less uh, chances of survival compared to the younger to the younger patients. 
fortunately for us, we haven't had to do that in our country yet. And I hope we don't get to do that. But um, if that were the case, uh, the PCP guidelines, actually, the ethics committee guidelines are very good. They have come out with guidelines in the website. And, the, and this is the international guidelines as well, that we suggest triage teams be established to decide on who gets the ventilators rather than the attending physicians. This is to make sure that there is no conflict of interest. And the attending physicians um, don't, you know, they don't need to make that decision. The triage team usually will be composed of different members such as doctors, um, pastoral care, palliative care, the nursing staff, admin. So they get to they get to vote and they get to decide rather than those involved in the situation. And naturally, for those people who are not given respirators, appropriate palliative care should be offered. Um, this is from the PCP Ethics Committee, actually, the do not resuscitate decision making. Uh, there are different situations where you might, this might need to decide if a DNR is to be done. So if the patients themselves understand and their surrogates understand and communicate that they do not want the CPR, or if they follow the clinician's recommendations to forgo CPR. And the more extreme situation where CPR cannot be effective or reduced or um, increases the risk to other people. I put the question mark there because it's, it's a very, very difficult decision. But if there is greater risk for the healthcare workers or for the other people, for example, in the emergency room, then CPR shouldn't be done. We advocate that advanced care planning has to be started at the earliest possible time. And this is even before admission, even before, if you know the patient, even before they go to the ER or the hospital. Um, this involves advanced directives. And if they're unable to make decisions for themselves, have a substitute decision maker already. And you decide on withholding or withdrawing interventions. What do the advanced directives say? Um, actually, the University of the Philippines came out with their guidelines for COVID-19, ethics guidelines for COVID-19. Um, at the end of their guidelines, they had suggested English and Filipino uh, advanced directives. So if you don't have advanced directives in your hospital, um, they do have a template at the end of their guidelines, if you would like that. They also have templates on um, substitute maker decision, uh, substitute decision maker uh, appointments. So the advanced directives will show that the patient is aware of the situation, what medical interventions are to be done and not done, the treatments considered, if they consent or don't consent to research, and resuscitation, palliative care, and pastoral care. Don't forget pa pastoral care and palliative care because um, we don't, you know, we don't assume that just because we don't see a cross in the patient or we don't see them praying that they are not uh, in need of some other form of care aside from medical care. Um, a lot of people, you know, at the end of their lives want to talk to someone else. Okay, so palliative care and pastoral care are also important. In terms of research and off-label therapeutics, and this is a huge amount of research is being done now, um, it must be justified. There must be a reason. Remember all the, um, all the guidelines for doing research. Just because it's a pandemic doesn't mean that you forget all of those guidelines. So there must be informed consent. They must know, the patients must know that research is being done on them or with them. Um, and the hospital authority must consent also to the research. Okay. As to telehealth, have a lot of you been doing telehealth? Uh, ha have a lot of you been coerced into doing telehealth? You have a lot of patients, but don't, you know, don't assume that your patients are able to do it. Um, some are technologically challenged, so you have to coordinate. But 
the issues, ethical issues with telehealth would be consent, number one. Um, that they consent to this. You know, sometimes the patients who consult us, uh, they consult us um, reluctantly. So when you're doing telehealth, they might not be consenting to it also, okay? So their, their relatives might be coercing them. Confidentiality is important. Are you sure that your Zoom session is confidential, that it's not going to be Zoom bombed? Okay. Um, and that you have, are you able to establish a professional relationship online? Um, some doctors prefer not to see new patients. They will only see their old patients because they already know their old patients. They already have the rapport. Uh, some patients accept new patients. Uh, some doctors accept new patients. But they must be able to establish that rapport. And um, for physicians, it's difficult to do your physical exam uh, based on what you see alone. Okay? So how will you do that? Another one is how do you establish the identity of the patient? Are you going to ask them to, okay, please hold up your ID to make sure that that is really you? Or um, how do you also make sure that the patient has appropriate access to the telemedicine. Okay. So a lot of our patients don't have internet actually, you know, how are they going to do that? And what are your backup plans? If the patient has high blood pressure right in front of you, or they're having a stroke right in front of you, how are you going to make sure that they are going to be able to do what they need to do? Okay. So connected to that is what is your liability? Um, if, if, for example, something happens to the patient, how liable are you going to be with telehealth? And how do you charge the patient? Um, in some hospitals, they have been establishing, um, there are websites that are able to charge the patients. Um, there are also, yung mga globe, ano yun? the, 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 they're able to do in electronic banking. Um, so, so that's another thing. There are other uh, physicians who opt not to charge. Like I, I am doing telehealth, but only on the patients that I know. I'm not, I don't accept new patients. And my patients are, Doctora, paano kami magbabayad sa inyo? It's okay. I know I will see you again personally. Doon na lang kayo magbayad. So gonna, for some, some doctors, they prefer that. Other doctors, I know actually are not charging for telehealth. Okay. Um, so you have to determine all of those before you even start the program for telehealth. Okay. I think that's it. Oh, okay. So to summarize, um, pandemics present a huge challenge and we go from conventional treatment to contingency to, to crisis. We want to make sure that we are only in the crisis stage for a very short time and then we go back to contingency right after so every single patient who could benefit from a scarce resource deserves the resource. But due to scarcity, not all helpful treatments may be given to everyone. But that does not mean that any patient is more or less deserving than another. So we need to make sure that we continue to care for every single patient. These are my resources. Um, and I would like to acknowledge Professor Dudinsky and the Clinical Ethics Consultation affinity group of the ASBH for all their resources that they made available online. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Agnes Pusuego, for the practical and very comprehensive um, discussion on the ethical issues at the time of COVID-19. Uh, Attorney Rebosa is with us now, and may I just uh, say something about uh, uh, before he talks uh, for us. Uh, Attorney, you were already introduced earlier together with uh, Dr. Busuego. Uh, his talk will be on the legal implications of telemedicine and medical, legal, ethical, social impact on the physician's practice. And it is the request of Attorney Rebosa to have the open forum after his talk that uh, the questions should, that are directed to him or for him. And then we'll have the open forum for Dr. Agnes um, Busuego after uh, Attorney Rebosa has engaged us in discussion because he has uh, 
an emergency after his talk. So, Attorney Rebosa, are you ready, sir? Can you hear me right now? Yeah. Uh, can you? Do you have sound? Yes. Please let me know if you could hear. Yeah. Anyway, uh, good morning, everyone. Sorry. Uh, I'm quite in a panic mode right now, and I can certainly relate to the patience that you have. Uh, just about, uh, at about 9.30, uh, my wife had an accident uh, here in the house, and I woke up, and uh, she, has a, she fell to the ground, and she has right now a very big, uh, deep uh, laceration on her left eyebrow, and seeing all those blood, and She's dizzy right now. We're supposed to bring her to the hospital. And uh, I'm a doctor. And seeing her in that, I have to keep composure. So I had to call up, uh, show them the, the pictures. So parang I, I couldn't. I mean, if I have this lecture, probably my first impulse will have to bring her to the emergency room right away. But knowing that I wouldn't be exposing her to, to COVID and I myself will have to bring her there. You know? So you can just feel how, how things are so different right now. You know? And I had to send pictures. I had to talk to them. So everything's all about telemedicine. So hopefully I, I, I could finish you know, this, 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 uh, some of the slides that I have uh, uh, prepared. And anyway, everybody knows my number. <laughs> if you have problems later on, you can just call me. So if I might just... Uh, uh, get on with the first uh, few slides which I was preparing just before that accident. I hope my wife doesn't get mad at me for delaying no? uh, uh, me bringing her to the hospital. And uh, the medical director even offered to uh, send an ambulance here at the house, but I said, just like <laughs> Dr. Uh, the previous speaker had said, no, me stigma. I mean, my, my uh, my neighbors probably would be bothered that everybody would be talking about you know, whether one has COVID here and uh, you get discriminated. But anyway, can I have the first slide, please? So I'll just go over it very, very fast. Uh, hello?
Am I okay na? I'm alright? Yeah, okay. Sorry. Technical difficulties. So this is the problem you're going to have with the telemedicine or, or the technology with the so slow Wi-Fi that we have. So just a few slides. Now the COVID-19 pandemic, it's medical, legal, ethical, and social impact on the on physician's practice right now. So next, please. Next slide. Next, next. Can I have the next slide, please? The next one. Okay, right, so for doctors, please go back. Uh, some more, some more. Just the second slide. One more. Ah, sorry. Yeah, okay, okay. So doctors should be familiar and they must have a basic knowledge of uh, the, the laws, no? And of course, of code of ethics. Next one, the, the next one, please. Can okay, the next one? The next, next slide. This one. So familiarity and base. No, go back, go back. S second slide, please. Right after the intro. Can... All right, so familiarity and basic knowledge with the law and medical ethics is a must for us doctors. So, of course, the law that is still, no, uh, the uh, law that governs the medical profession is the outdated Medical Act of 1959. Uh, we must also take into consideration the Data Privacy Act of 2012 with regards to reporting of these cases and how we do contact tracing and the like. And of course, how do we prescribe medicines now if you're going to do telemedicine? And Republic Act 11332, the law on reporting of communicable diseases. And of course, Republic Act 11469, no? by Anihan to Heal as One Act, which grants uh, the president emergency powers for a limited period. And it also involves, uh, or it uh, also enunciates for us some duties and obligations on doctors with respect to reporting of uh, uh, positive COVID patients. And of course, each of our hospitals, no, they have their own rules, especially now that we're opening our clinics. Uh, patients cannot just go to the clinic. No? Many hospitals would need that the uh, uh, appointments must first be set with the doctor and these appointments must be first be uh, screened and uh, approved by the hospital before these patients can go see the doctor. And uh, right now we are seeing some problems with this no? because patients would want to be seen right away. But patients do not want to go to the emergency room just like me. No? ER, but I have no choice. So, uh, if uh, nobody can do a... Uh, home service suturing, and besides, uh, you know, the hypotension could be something else. Now, our own special, your own specialty society guidelines, or your own specialty societies have their own guidelines and policies with respect to how we now treat our patients, or guidelines also on the DNR, or what you do at the ICU with respect to the wearing of the PPEs and the like. Next, please. Next. Next. Next slide. And then the next one, please. Yeah, all right. So there's been a problem with telemedicine. They're saying that uh, the Medical Act of 1959 mandates that uh, there must be physical examination. No? Uh, let's please go back. Go, go back to the other slide. There must be a face-to-face -face confrontation between the doctor and the patient. No? Uh, telephone conversations or teleconsult may not be considered as... Uh, establishing a physician-patient relationship because uh, uh, the law says that there must be a physical no, conflict, uh, or face-to-face -face set up. But the, the same law also states that, can we go back, please? Can we go back? Uh, the previous slide, please. Yeah. But it also says there, no, under letter B, that... Uh, no. <laughs> this is, this is, Next, next one. That any means of communication, no? uh, and the any means of communication, okay. Any other, any other means of communication, no. Uh, so probably that would uh, refer to telemedicine or teleconsult, no, and the like. Now, also under Section Ten of Republic Act Eleven Three Three Two, the mandatory reporting of diseases and health events or public health concerns, no. It states there that. The tampering of records or intentionally providing misinformation 
no both that is both for the uh, patients and the doctors no is a criminal act that may result in both criminal and administrative prosecution criminal meaning if you are convicted you face a possible fine of between 20 to 50000 pesos and a prison term of between 1 month to 6 months and possible uh, uh, case would uh, would be filed against you at the PRC, the Professional Regulations Commission, for revocation of the license of the doctors or any of the health providers who would be uh, guilty of tampering with records or intentionally providing misinformation. Okay. Next, please. Can I have uh, next, please? The next lecture. Next one. Okay, can, uh, so let's go into telemedicine. Next, please. So telemedicine can either be of two things, it's either be a telephone consult or one that would be using the smartphone or your laptops with a video consultation. Just if you just use telephone consultation, no, this is probably more uh, uh, risky than that of uh, when you're using a smartphone with video. Because in telephone medicine, there's no video. It's a plain phone call. You don't get to... Uh, uh, identify who the patient is. You don't get to see the lesions, no. Unlike, of course, for uh, when there's smart video, although it does not take the place of an actual face-to-face -face, uh, consult, no, with the, with the patient. At least you maybe about eighty to ninety percent, no. Although depending on the uh, the signal and the uh, uh, the Wi-Fi that you have, which in the Philippines is really a big big problem, right? Just like right now. Okay, next, please. Next, next slide. Can I have the next one, please? Uh, all right. So can can we go further? Next, please. All right. So uh, next one. Next, next, next pa, next pa, next pa, next, next, next one. So telemedicine, no, is now being encouraged by the DOH, no. Uh, especially for these times, but probably uh, if and if and when this pandemic goes away, then we'll have to go back, no, to uh, to hopefully within the next uh, few months or several years, now we can go back to the real normal. So we are we are in a new normal. So just some reminders, maybe if you're going to perform or going to do teleconsult or telemedicine, that before you do such, there must I'm not taking. No? There must be a consent form or a waiver or disclaimer that will have to be electronically uh, uh, signed and or uh, uh, signed by the patient, no, or that he would agree to such a thing. So, like in this one, I understand there's no guarantee that this telemedicine consult will eliminate the need for me to see a doctor in person, and uh, I shall not hold the doctor and the medical staff liable for any incomplete or inadequate treatment. Okay, I got uh, here. So let's let's. Go back first. Uh, the first one. Ding sa una, please. Okay. So the patient is acknowledging that an online medical virtual consult or telemedicine consult is not a substitute for a regular or face to face consult at the OPD due to its inherent limitations, like among others, inadequacy of physical examinations, lack of access to medical tools, and difference between the accuracy of treatment using photographs or videos as compared with face-to-face -face clinical assessment and our physical presence in the clinic setting. That it has been fully explained to me. So you have to spend some time also, if there would be questions from the patient, to explain how medical telemedicine consult may affect such consultation and accuracy of the advice given. He understands and agrees that the doctor can discontinue the telemed consult if it is felt that the video conference connections are not adequate no, for the situation and or continuation thereof may not be to the best interest of the patient. Like for instance, nag away na kayo, no? Uh, uh, medyo hard to talk to yung pasyente. If he has difficulty understanding and the like, it doesn't serve his best interest then, no? The doctor will have the right to uh, discontinue and then probably just, of course, advise the patient to go to uh, uh, see a, uh, I mean, uh, for a physical uh, uh, checkup, no? And or to the emergency room if it's an emergency. Next, please. Next. Next, next, next one. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So there's no guarantee that uh, this consultation will eliminate the need for for the patient to see. Can Can we go back? 
it's too fast. It's too fast. Really. Can can we go back to the concept? Well, anyway, so uh, so for that concept, no, uh, yeah. <laughs> just just one more, just one more. The second page of the concept. Next after this one, the next one. You sunod pa, sunod pa, please. Okay, all right. The medical staff shall not be held liable for any incomplete or inadequate treatment, management, or mis misdiagnosis if the same was a result of the patient having withheld any medical information or due to inherent limitations of the consult and other unforeseen and unavoidable circumstances that he certifies that is freely, knowingly, and voluntarily given his consent to doctor so-and-so to obtain, collect, examine, process, and store copies of the personal information, including sensitive personal and medical data, privileged information, and medical records. That he, uh, by his voluntary engagement of the services of the doctor, he is providing his personal information and allows the doctor to examine him, giving his consent to the said doctor to collect, store, access, share, and process his personal data and medical information, whether manually or electronically. Next, please. Next, please. Next, next. Next, next. The next one. Okay, any information obtained relative to the authoritarian shall be strictly confidential. No, uh, so you have to make sure no, that in, uh, during the teleconsultation, no, everything is confidential and private. Uh, the patient may not be comfortable if he sees a lot of people there. So that part on the video screen is just him and you as the doctor. And uh, can, can we go back, please? Just go back lang muna. So next. This is very important. Can we... Just previous slide, please. Previous one. Okay. And he understand that the physician or and the medical staff involved in this teleconsult are entitled to a professional fee. Uh, one, one slide forward, please. Entitled the professional fee. Now, this is probably quite a sensitive uh, issue as to how and when no, the patient is going to pay. Is the patient going to pay first before the consult? Is, will the patient have to pay after consult and before you give your prescription? And or will he only pay after everything has been done? No, uh, ito siguro yung ethics natin, no? yung problema. Uh, but I, some bioethicists are now saying that it's okay to collect first, no, before seeing the patient, no. Uh, so all three options, no, before giving the prescription, that you charge first or right after. But the problem is after the consultation, the patient might just run away and not pay you, no. And uh, so this is something that must be cleared with the patient. Now I further certify that the information has been disclosed are true and correct to the best of its knowledge and belief. Okay, next, please. Next, 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 okay, next, please. Okay, okay, next, next, next. So, so look at the slide. Yeah, 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 I'll be there. Yeah, yeah, I'll finish with this one and then we'll take her to the hospital. Okay, so problematic areas of concern that may lead to litigation. So late, prolonged, or delayed diagnosis because of the inherent problems, absence or documentation, or inadequate records. So you have to keep records. No? So you may have to record misdiagnosis because of failure to get authority history, defective, poor, inadequate communication with family or patient. And of course, like what we're having now, technical problems, untrained, unqualified root staff giving medical advice, especially just for plain telephone consults, improper, imprudent medical management resulting from the above, no? privacy and confidentiality issues, Prescription and medical certificates. No, so how do you give it? Just scan a copy and then send it through Viber, maybe, and or you know. Uh, but you have to make sure, no, uh, right to privacy because sometimes you inadvertently send uh, or post the uh, a wrong. Um, uh, I mean, the medical certificate or medical records to uh, uh, a wrong recipient. No, so sometimes it, it it does happen that you send your medical records, medical certificates to wrong entities. So they must know of your clinic schedule and after your clinic schedule, if it's probably is after five, if there's an emergency or what, how do they get hold of you? Know, so what are your after hour service? You, give, you have to give them instructions that if it's an emergency, then if you cannot, they cannot get in touch with you, they have to go to uh, uh, the emergency room or some other place. Okay. 
professional fees, may mga problem with the reasonableness, manner or mode of patient, payment. No, are you going to charge less or are you going to charge more? No? Uh, people are saying that you're going to that you should charge less because uh, mas konti daw ang puhunan. But I'm saying that your chances of being sued is higher no, if you're doing teleconsult. So maybe you will just have to uh, increase also your PF. So it depends. No? Siguro pareho na lang. It should not be lower than what you are charging if there was, was a, there is a face-to-face -face consultation. Then you should have the proper consent, whether it's a waiver, a disclaimer, or jurisdiction and venue of trial. Now this is the problem no, from a legal viewpoint. The venue of the trial in criminal cases is supposedly where the offense was committed. Nag-opera ka sa Manila, may nangyari masama sa pasyente, ang criminal case should be in Manila. But your patient is calling from Davao and something goes wrong. Does it mean that where would the trial be? Is it going to be in Manila where saan ka nakatira? Or do you have to go to Davao, criminal case yan, you have to go there. No? So that's something that maybe uh, telemedicine or uh, some of our laws have not yet, uh, uh, you know, uh, as I've said, no, our laws have not caught up with technology. So yun ang problema. PRC case, madali lang. It's, it's all there at PICC. That's the venue. Civil case, no, uh, the, 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 the complainant or the patient has a choice of where to sue. Pero ang problema nga dito siya criminal case. No? Kasi wala pa sa batas namin. Eh. I mean, wala pa, uh, it, it's not really clear. No? Because our patients are especially face-to-face. -face. Pwede ka na magkapasyente from Visayas and from Mindanao. No? or maybe from other countries. But of course, in other countries, you cannot be really be sued there no? because they have to sue you here in the Philippines. And taxes, reporting payment, issuance of receipts, then you just probably have to scan your, your OR, send it to them, and then later on, when things are better, they can get the uh, receipts yourself. Now, how do you report this? Well, of course, whether you issue uh, official receipts or not, you're supposed to declare no, your income. Next, please. Attorney, Attorney Rebosa, do you really have to go now? Uh, we yeah, understand. Uh, I'll just finish with one, ano, then I'll go. Okay. Because oh, I'm bleeding now ulit. Eh. Uh, thank, yeah. So if you have to go, Attorney, we understand. Uh, do you want to continue or? Yeah, I'll just finish with this one. Okay, thank yes. you, sir. Ah, yeah. So when does a patient-physician relationship start with uh, telemedicine? No? So probably it would start right after the patient has given his electric electronic uh, consent. No? I don't know how it goes because I'm not tech here. So pag once there's electronic consent or once there's already a, at least there's an electronic consent after reading the consent form, no? uh, the physician-patient relation starts. In the absence of any uh, express consent, like it's electronic, the mere fact that she's consulting with you no, is already an implied consent. But of course, implied consent is more difficult to prove than that of express. But other than that, no, uh, in the video recording of the teleconsult permissible, I would rather know that you record the uh, the teleconsultation. But it should be you, not the patient, if only to protect yourself also. Uh, what are the liabilities of doctors who utilize medicine? Same thing, it's still criminal, civil, and administrative. Problem not then, how do you protect yourself from identity theft and illegal use of prescription and signature? Because now you are taking your uh, uh, photo scan, no? you, you take a photo of your of your uh, prescription okay? and you send it to them. They can just reproduce that. Anybody can just do this with plain, no? so yun problem ngayon, no? especially for employees. No? They can just that, uh, reproduce that again and hingi ulit ng, uh, ng leave. No? How many times does that happen that HR of these companies would uh, call the, the hospital, no, uh, trying to confirm and verify if the medical certificates are, are, uh, are uh, true or not. No? So anyway, uh, I'm sorry, I really have to go. Uh, I have to bring my wife. Yes, up. attorney, we if, understand. If you have any problems, anyway, you have my number, just give me a call. No? Thank you so, so much, attorney. And we, also for we, with we, me. we pray that your wife will be yes, okay. Please. Thank you so much, attorney. Thank, right, you, thank you, attorney Rebosa. Thank you so much. Bye. Godspeed po. Um, we apologize for the uh, technical difficulty uh, earlier and with your indulgence, we uh, allowed Attorney Rebosa to go ahead and not finish his talk and not answer the many questions that you just uh, sent us. But we promise you that uh, these will be answered by Attorney Rebosa uh, during the time that he can uh, keep in touch with the PCP. We will send him your concerns, your questions, and hopefully he can get back to us in the soonest possible time. But for now, our concern is the safety of his wife and we pray and hope that everything will be okay with the wife of Attorney Rebo. So we want to thank him 
for um, uh, indulging us with his talk, even if he has a medical emergency at home. So thank you, Attorney Rebosa. And uh, some are asking if we can have his slides sent to you. You have to ask permission first from him before we can do that. But rest assured that the PCP will uh, forward all your concerns to Attorney Rebosa uh, uh, during the time that he can reply to us uh, again. So um, thank you, Attorney Rebosa. Thank you, Dr. Agnes uh, Buswego, for those uh, very interesting talks. First time in the webinar of the PCP that an emergency happened. So live it all, so anything can happen. But so gusto natin, everybody is safe. So we are now, I think, ready for the open forum, this time only with Dr. Agnes Buswego, because we cannot answer the questions that you want to ask uh, Attorney Rebosa, if you have. So uh, technical staff, which is the first question for uh, Dr. Agnes? Wait, Dr. Agnes uh, for a while. Huh? Uh, you want to say something, Dr. Because I'm looking for the uh, questions that- I already uh, answered it... some questions in the Q&A. Okay. So if, yeah. You have answered questions already in the Facebook Live? Uh, uh, in the uh, Q&A part of the webinar. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm I just looking at the questions that will be forwarded to you because uh, the IT staff said they will be forwarded in the box provided in the Q&A. But I, the questions that are here with me now are <laughs> addressed for uh, Dr. For Attorney Rebosa. Rebosa, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I cannot answer them. But there's a question here, Doctor. Are digital signatures allowed? Uh, can you answer that? Or Attorney Rebosa should be the one to answer? Uh, yeah, I think that is for Attorney Rebosa. Yeah. I think he, he mentioned that you're allowed to have digital signatures. Yeah. Ah, I don't know. I, you have yeah. to ask Attorney Rebosa. <laughs> uh -oh. Uh, I'm asking the IT staff for questions that uh, are for you. Uh, Migo? Anak? I think, ano na lang po. Um, well, there are three questions here in the Q&A box. Um, Dr. Otaiza said if there's a bioethics short course for 2020 or 2021 from St. Luke's. Um, I'm not sure. We'll see. <laughs> Um, and then Dr. Bernal asked, what is the best time to discuss advanced directives for a conscious patient who is likely to expire within the next uh, one or two days? Um, I said, for this particular patient, I would suggest that as soon as possible, you discuss. Um, you talk to the patient and the relatives, and you can do it in such a way that you don't offend them. You know, baka kasi that you're thinking na pinapangunahan yun na yung demise. But, you know, you can ask in the event that something happens to you that you're unable to make decisions on your own, who would you like to make those decisions for you? Or in the event that you need to be intubated just in case, because this is what happens usually, um, do you want to be intubated? So this ensures that the patient will still feel in control of their situation rather than, because that's a really big factor, eh, that the patient does not feel that they have control over what's happening to them. So you empower them pa rin. Uh, mm -hmm. And then for some cases, Dr. Bernal is asking, watchers change at daily intervals. How do you ensure that the primary guardian release agreed upon advanced directives to other watchers? Um, it, this is why we like family meetings. It's, I think it's good that you have, if you have a family meeting quite regularly. Um, according to JCI, I think if there are three more than three services involved, you should be having family meetings weekly um, so, so that you are able to relay what the plan is for the patient and the patient is able to relay what they would like to happen. And, and all the family members are able to clarify and ask their questions um, from all the services involved. So And then the family meeting should be properly documented in the patient's chart, and all those who attended will sign. Uh, that's to protect you, but also to make sure that they they understand what's going on. Dr. Meg, there's a question here. Is there ethical issue with regards to residents and fellows on training who refuse to be 
frontliners during this time of pandemic? Ah. Um, <laughs> technically, kasi talagang they have a choice. Na, they should have a choice because it's, diba, we also have a duty to take care of our healthcare workers. Yes. Uh, they, but they also have to understand that they are in training. So, um, if the training involves taking care of COVID positive patients, that is part of their training. If they absolutely refuse, they should be given a choice as to whether they want to do the COVID ward or not COVID ward, something else to be, that they will still be trained. But I think there are a lot of residents who are quitting. <laughs> and uh, I think the problem now is the residency training program because not many uh, doctors are applying for residency yeah. and fellowship nowadays because of the yeah. COVID scare. So I think it's you can understand their concern because yes. the, uh, they are afraid also for their own families. Yes, and their uh, own lives. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're very young. Yeah. <laughs> so, Unfortunately, yeah. you yes. know, kind of understand that talagang, ano, eh, um, it's a difficult decision for them. Kaya lang, mm. that's really part of the risk is part of the job. Eh. Yes, I know. <laughs> uh, there's a question here. Um, in some EN, EMRs, especially from abroad, there's a waiver at the end stating that the documents is digitally or electronically signed and everything is documented, as mentioned by Attorney Rebosa. No? So this is just a comment, I think, not really a question because uh, they were agreeing to the uh, lecture of Attorney Rebosa about the uh, everything should be well documented for our protection. I think the other questions were... Natabunan daw ng mga ibang questions. Uh, I cannot see the new questions because some of the questions, Dr. Meg, were already answered by you a while ago. Uh, yeah. Uh, how do we address the physician's duty to care as opposed to personal concern for safety? Is there an answer um, to that? <laughs> personal decision yun eh, Dr. Yeah. Um, it's up to you if you feel that you are unable to remember, if you decide to take care of a patient, you have to take care of them to the best of your ability. Hindi yeah. yung hearted. Uh -uh. Um, if you're not going to be able to do that, don't do it at all. You have uh -uh. to refer to someone else. Yeah. And then there's a question here. I don't know uh, if we have the answer because the question is how should we balance our need for surveillance with consideration of privacy? Um, in this case, like what I said, na the privacy, there will be a compromise with privacy because this is for the greater good of the community. Eh? Mm -hmm. so you really need to do surveillance. Um, with respect to, you don't have to necessarily tell them who they were exposed to, mm -hmm. that they were exposed. Um, I'm not sure if this is the case for HIV. I think HIV talagang specific. Eh? Pero... Mm -hmm. In terms of a pandemic, kasi you don't necessarily have to tell them how they were, who exposed them, yes. at least how they were exposed. Uh -huh. um, tapos, I think may, may tanong ako nakikita dito about the advanced directives being notarized. notarized. <laughs> um, that would be useful. At least kasi it becomes public knowledge. It's, it's part of the, it's good documentation. Um, I'm not so sure because if it's part of our law yet, I don't think it's part of our law technically. Pero uh, it doesn't harm. It doesn't do any harm to have it notarized. Mm -hmm. And then there's a question here, Doctora. Uh, what can you say about people accompanying the pediatric <laughs> patient? <laughs> May I take a video of the consultation? Um, oh, oh, actually, that, that happens a lot now. Eh. Um, I think it's a personal choice also for the doctors. Um, that also means kasi that your rapport might not be great with the patient mm -hmm. and the relatives if they mm -hmm. are trying to document it that way. Um, but there are some clinics who, yes, yeah, say na no videos or pictures allowed in clinics. Mm -hmm. um, this is, I think, more to respect the privacy of the other patients also. Eh. Yeah. I think, Dr. when the Data Privacy Act was very new, uh, yeah. All doctors refuse taking photos, videos of their consultations while ongoing. I've had uh, an experience wherein a patient, a relative was secretly uh, recording our conversation. Yes. I did not notice it until I 
notice na he was uh, twinkling with his phone and then I told him, it's not allowed. And can you delete it in front of me? Because they should ask permission if I will allow the consultation to be recorded. Yes, yeah, definitely. I think uh, it boils down to the Data Privacy Act. But as you said in your discussion, this is a pandemic. So it's not the same as the normal uh, clinical situations that we are used to having in the past. Yes. And then uh, there's a comment. I saw the differentiation, uh, a video that differentiates telehealth and telemedicine. Oh, nga naman. Magkaiba ba yun, Doktora Ben? Ang, ang, tele, ang telehealth, kasi madaming, ano yan eh, parang madami siyang arms. Mm -hmm. So parang telemedicine is, they treat, kasi some people, they can just diagnose. Or kasi in other specialties, yung mga radiologists, they can help the, they can just look at the slide of the, um, or pathology even. They can just mm -hmm. look at the slides, or they can just mm -hmm. look at the films. So walang treatment involved. So there are differences if there's treatment involved. There's also teleconsults na may doctor dun sa other end. Tapos yung doctor to doctor ang consultation. Mm -hmm. May ganun eh. Uh, parang telementary. Parang referral. Uh -oh. yes, parang referral. Uh -oh. Pero actually, uh -oh. hindi siya specialist. Kumbaga parang GP lang siya. Uh -oh. Tapos kayo yung specialist. May ganun type eh. Uh -oh. uh, doon naman, ang problema uh, in terms of responsibility may responsibility ka ba towards the patient? Hindi mo naman siya pasyente. Pasyente siya ng isang doktor. So, may mga ganun eh. Um, madaming implications yung telehealth and telemedicine in terms of responsibilities. That's why hirap tayo ngayon to implement it. You have to, you have to be cautious din kasi. Majority of patients, okay lang, walang problema. But you can have, you know, the one or two patients eh. <laughs> problem. Uh, I think the one who asked the question is trying to educate us because uh, the comment was saying when you say telemedicine, it involves yeah. the doctor, the patient, the video, and yeah. at the end of the con the consultation, getting paid. Mm -hmm. Telehealth yata yung parang uh, referring without uh, getting paid or actual treatment. I don't know. I've never uh, been really. Tapos kasi yun, issues of payment. How do you determine? And yeah. then they pay you. Uh oh. Uh oh. So there are many platforms already for telemedicine these days. And then ito pa yung question, um, what about online family meetings, Doctora? Is it advisable, especially in your uh, field? Um, you can still do online family meetings. In fact, we do that for, di ba? Kasi madaming Filipinos are based abroad and then they have yeah. relatives who get, who get admitted here. So pwede naman yun kasi by virtue of we cannot have everyone in the same room. Mm -hmm. Okay lang naman. Um, basta, ang, I agree with the suggestion of Attorney Rebosa of videotaping, record. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, that's what I do with my current uh, practice. I ask the patient, is it okay if I videotape our conversation just for my records? Mm -hmm. So I get their consent for that. Mm -hmm. para, may, para may protection ka pa rin. Mm -hmm. Then a question of trust. <laughs> Is trust an issue for us in the country? <laughs> Maybe I should I know, uh, put that back to you to you also. Do you think do you think that trust is an issue in our country? Mistrust and trust? Because uh, in the Ob Ebola outbreak. Yeah. Um, I think generally in the Philippines, naman, doctors are trusted pa rin. I mean, they're very well trusted. May isa o dalawa lang na bad apples. Uh -uh. Pero in general, the Filipino people tend to trust their doctors naman. So yes. hopefully, we don't abuse that trust. Uh -uh. And you have to trust the government also. Yeah. <laughs> because... also we also trust that the patients are telling us the truth. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. Naman. Yes. Iba rin yung sinasabi nila. So yeah. trust is a two-way process. Yeah. Anyway, kasi pati gobyerno. Mm -mm. Is there a proper way of disposal of digital consents, clinical history, and other documents sent online? Um, Interesting question. Hmm, yeah. Mm -mm. Uh, but why would you want to dispose of them? Shouldn't you keep them like your records, regular records? Shouldn't they be kept for a certain amount of time also? Like in the data privacy, it says like 10 years, diba? Pero yun yung mga 
uh, paper uh, records. I, I don't know. It's a good way to delete. I'm not that technical, technologically <laughs> advanced. But Sabi. there's a good way to delete. Eh. Um, it's either that or you totally destroy your hard drive. Your phone or your, yeah, or your hard drive. Yeah. Maybe we can ask the uh, techie people or the legal people about this. So, anyway, the questions that we cannot answer with Dr. Uh, uh, Agnes Busuego now are going to be sent to Attorney Rebosa because some of these have legal um, implications. And then, yun pa, allowed, are we allowed to uh, put our logo of the hospital, organizations, without permission, without asking permission from this said institute? No, we're not allowed. Um. The hospitals, I'm sure the hospitals are very strict about their yes. uh, logos. Yes. So even with our calling cards, eh, diba? we're not supposed to be putting logos if we're not authorized. Mm -mm. Dr. Ramek, this one I think is very relevant. If the patient already gave his or her advanced directive when he or he she is still conscious, then once the event happened, is it acceptable for the relatives to retract the advanced directive? <laughs> um. This happens. This really happens. Yes. This happens also with organ transplantation donation. Um, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what's happening? Eh? They are allowed to retract. Because we still request, we still try to respect the relatives' decisions also. Um, pero as much as possible, you try to explain to them that this is what the patient. That's why it's important to have the family meetings. Eh? Yes. That it's um this was the patient's wish and we would like to respect the patient's wish. Yeah. Um so if that if if the patient if the patient uh, wrote the directive sane in his sane and normal uh, being. Um jan magkakaroon ng issue legally. Yes. Kasi kung talagang nagii-insist yung relatives na ayaw nila, you might have to go to court. Yeah. Maybe because of uh, some ulterior motive or yes. like may pension na yes. pag namatay, mawawala. Or yung mga, and this has happened, yung mga may second family. Yes. Tapos hindi nag agree Yes. Okay. So, so Attorney Rebosi okay. will shed light on that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, how do we immediately check the truthfulness of the patient? Like they consented not to record the consultation and then you found out that they were recording. Um, if you do find out that they're recording, ano yan eh, ibig sabihin, talagang there is a trust, there's a problem with your basic relationship already. Mm -hmm. So, you might want to explore that, na parang okay. why did, na in a non-confrontational way, why they felt they had to record the session, even without your consent. Um, and I guess for your protection, you should also write that, note that down in your charts. Uh -uh. Um, that something happened and um, if if there really is a breakdown of trust, you might end up having to refer them to someone else. Na parang you can tell them, uh, I don't think that I can be your doctor at this time uh -huh. because something happened. Yeah. Um, it, maybe it's perhaps it's best that I refer you to another colleague. Uh -huh. uh, pero make sure that you are not charged with abandonment abandoning the patient din naman. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how do you do that, Dr. Rameg? Do you put it in writing or just verbal, uh, verbally saying it with it hold? I put it in writing in my chart. I would put it in writing in my chart, um, but you explain it to them. Uh, kaya lang legally, I, you'd have to ask Attorney Rebosa what the implications are for that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but definitely put it in your chart. Even yes. if you don't have a recording of what happened, the events that happened, still mm -hmm. write it down. Yeah. And then there's a very useful message here for permanently deleting files in Windows 10. Oh, ang galing ng mga uh, participants natin. This might help. HTTPS hash and by slash tweet google.com permanently delete files window. So Google nyo na lang po. Meron pa lang way to do that. There's a, another question, Dr. Ramek. Are there additional specifics on the ethical issues for doing research during pandemic? There are guidelines already. Um, there are lots of guidelines. I only had 30 minutes for my lecture, but uh, <laughs> there are guidelines for doing research. If you would like more information, um, I can do the research for you, but there are they are easily available online. Na. 
Mm-hmm. Everything is available, made available online uh, for free because now it's a pandemic. Mm-hmm. Are there more questions? Uh, rapid antibody testing, do you recommend that informed medical consent be taken prior to conducting the test? And what should be included in the informed consent? Okay. Definitely, they should be. They should have informed consent. Just because the company is mandating that it be done doesn't mean that their consent is negated. So they should still have informed consent. What is included? Tip, yung typical po na informed consent. Um, ah, tapos some. What if? Eto na na isip ko is what if ayon nila. Um, the company's mandating it, pero ayaw nila. Ano yung repercussions nun? I think that would be for legal. Mm-hmm. Um, pero definitely may informed consent. Kasi baka sabihin, ano, sisisantihin mo ba? Dahil yes. ayaw magpa-test? Yes. May HR problem and the uh, labor problem yun. So madami yes. yatang issues doon, Dr. Ramil. Ang interesting ng mga questions, especially for kanina yung mga kay Attorney Rebosa, no? so ipapasend natin sa kanya. So, Are there more questions, amigo? Or napagod na ba natin si Doktora? <laughs> <laughs> I think Doktora may guess answered uh, a lot and most of the questions that were posted here, both in the chat box and I think sa FB Live. So, Doktora, may do you have uh, uh, a last oh. comment or parting words for our <laughs> participants? Thank you very much, Paul, for your interest in the field and hopefully you all keep safe. <laughs> Yeah, and we hope you keep safe too, Dr. Rameg. So I think there are no more questions that I can see in the chat box. Am I right, Migo, and the rest of the PCPIT staff? So, um, Dr. Rameg, uh, we want to thank you. We want to keep, uh, uh, we are praying that you be safe always, and we hope to see you again uh, in our uh, future uh, webinars like this. So thank you for, so much for your time. We want to also thank all the participants for attending our 10th uh, webinar uh, sponsored by both the Department of Health and the Philippine College of Physicians. And of course, uh, we want to thank Attorney Rebosa, who despite his medical emergency granted us his uh, talk, although it was cut short, but uh, we promise that uh, he'll get back to you with all the answers to your many questions. Once uh, the situation in his home is uh, stable and we pray that uh, his wife be okay and uh, be safe and be healed uh, as soon as possible. So uh, with that, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you Dr. Dr. Agnes. And thank you to all the participants. And this has been your moderator, Dr. Agnes Cruz, signing off for the PCP. Thank you and have a good day, everyone.